Welcome to our worship this Remembrance Sunday. We are here to worship Almighty God, whose purposes are good, whose power sustains the world he has made, who loves us though we have failed in his service, who gave Jesus Christ for the life of the world, and who by his Holy Spirit leads us in his way. As we give thanks for his great works, we remember those who have lived and died in his service and in the service of others. We pray for those who suffer through war and are in need. We ask for his help and blessing, that we may do his will and that the whole world may acknowledge him as Lord and King. Let us commit ourselves to responsible living and faithful service. Merciful God, we offer to you the fears in us that have not yet been cast out by love. May we accept the hope you have placed in the hearts of all people and live lives of justice, courage and mercy through Christ our risen Redeemer. Amen. So we come to our act of penitence. Let us confess to God the sins and shortcomings of the world, its pride, its selfishness, its greed, its evil divisions and hatred. Let us confess our share in what is wrong, and our failure to seek and establish that peace which God wills for us. God of peace, forgive us when we have participated in that which turns people against each other. For fueling anger and harbouring vengeance and for not heeding your call to love one another. Inspire us never to give up on the hope that your life offers us and the courage to see past conflict and desolation and live for the day when there will be peace. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the peace and power of the Spirit all our days. Amen.
reading is taken from the book of Micah, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. The scene is a Royal Air Force station on a recent Remembrance Sunday. After the service, the chaplain is in the officer's mess for a pre-lunch drink. The commanding officer says to the chaplain, Oh, well, thanks, Padre, good sermon. But uh, how come you got through the whole thing and never even mentioned the war? Ah, that's, uh, I wasn't born, said the Padre. I wasn't there. The commanding officer looked at him quizzically and said, well, won't you have the same problem at Christmas or at Easter? You weren't there either. And this goes to the heart of the matter. Remembrance Day is not simply about what we can remember. When we tell the story of the Son of God who was born in humble poverty in a stable, and then of Jesus cruelly put to a criminal's death on the cross, and then gloriously alive again on Easter morning, the very essence of our faith and hope that there is new life beyond the grave. We are responding to Jesus' words. When you share the bread and the wine, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Keep telling the story. If we neglect to tell the story, our lives will be infinitely the poorer. If we remember to tell the story, those we remember will live on in honor and in our love. You know, for nearly 30 years, I attended Remembrance Day services here in Axmouth, and each year, I heard the names recited of 24 Axmouth men who had died on military service, 22 of them in World War I, and another two in World War II. Inevitably, their names were to me no more than names, respectfully spoken each November. Now for some in church, who had lived through these years since 1918, real memories of individuals and of families would be stirred. But the reality of those lives became more and more dim, more remote as the years went on. Now, as many of you will be aware, our old Axmouth friend, the late 
Mike Clement. From about the year 2000, he persistently sought to explore the lives of the men whose names appear on that granite cross in our churchyard. And during the year of 2012, Mike, with Doris, his wife, went in person to the war graves in France and in Flanders. And they saw for themselves the resting places of seven of the Axmouth lads whose names are recorded on, on our war memorial. And Mike wrote, as I stood there looking at the sheer magnitude of the cemetery and thinking of the terrible waste of the young lives, the breeze suddenly picked up and sighed and whispered through the leaves on the trees. It was a very moving moment indeed, and it brought tears to my eyes. It was something I shall never forget. Many of us here today can give thanks for our own long lives, full of interest and fulfillment, surrounded by the love of family and friends. And some here even served themselves during World War II, and they met suffering and loss at first hand. But most of those whose names we remember today were cut down in their prime, or scarcely before their adult lives had begun at all. And whether they went willingly or went reluctantly to serve, the stark fact remains that they did not return. And their loved ones were left only with an aching sense of loss and of what might have been. So there are just two names I would like to reflect upon this morning. Ivor Solway was the youngest of six sons born to Emma and Henry Solway of number seven, Higher Axmouth. Ivor was born in 1898 and he attended Axmouth School, which is now the village hall. And he left school aged 14 in 1912. All his older brothers enlisted in the Navy or the Army when war broke out in 1914. And one imagines that Ivor did not want to be left out when all his brothers joined up. Mike Clement had a newspaper account of Ivor's death in July 1916. Ivor was 17 years old. He would have been 18 in the August. But the paper says that he had already been in France for 15 months at the time of his death. So it follows that he must have enlisted in the first Dorsetshire's aged 16, sometime late in 1914. Early in July 1916, there was a bitter battle for a small but crucial stretch of land near the fortified village of Tietval. The ferocity and intensive nature of the fighting is unimaginable as one reads these first-hand accounts. The British had ambitious plans to attack the heavily defended German lines. Lieutenant Dewey wrote in his report, I came to a bridge over a defile which our plan of attack required us to cross. The bridge, marked with unerring accuracy uh, by the German machine gunners, was heaped with our dead and wounded, so as to be almost impossible. A British platoon, 48 in strength, 
as they set foot on the bridge, emerged with a strength of just 12 when they reached the other side. Sergeant Major Hodge wrote, the first sections to go were met by a hail of bullets and so well was the fire directed that many casualties occurred. Suddenly we heard someone playing a flute. And then we heard the strains of our regimental march past. Drum Major Kerr had gone forward with the sections and while others were gaining ground by short rushes, he was calmly walking in the open, playing the troops onwards. And he continued to play well-known tunes until his left arm was shattered by a bullet. Sergeant Major Shepherd reported, I saw the last platoon of A Company going over the open ground in front of the wood, distance of about 120 yards. Half of this platoon were killed. Almost all of the remainder were wounded in the crossing. The 3rd Company 180th Regiment was practically exterminated in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And amongst those who fell in that day's murderous fighting was the youngest son of Axmouth's Solway family, aged almost 18. Those very few years had been the full span of Ivor Solway's life and experience. This morning we also remember another of Axmouth's men whose name is not recorded on our war memorial or indeed on any war memorial in the UK but who is commemorated with honour on the memorial at Potsier in France on the Somme. And this man is Charles Ernest Bow. Charles was born just along the road here at number 43 Axmouth in January 1878. Mike Clement's meticulous research uncovered a most moving story of a man whose life had become shrouded in mystery, almost anonymity for reasons which may be we can deduce from the story of his life in his late teens and early twenties. There were six children born to George and Kate Bow. Four of them were born in Axmouth, but the family left Axmouth and moved to Crewe Kern in Somerset around 1887 when Charles was nine. When he was 13, he is described in the census of 1891 as an errand boy in Crewkern. But by the census of 1901, Charles is found not as a resident in Crewkern, but as an inmate of the prison in Shepton Mount, where his occupation is down as grocer's assistant. It's not clear how long he was detained in prison. There's no record as to what crime he was, for what crime he was committed to prison. All we know is that by the next census of 1911, Charles Bowl had moved away to Southampton, now aged 33, and he was still single. We know also that Charles Bowl enlisted in Southampton in late 1914 in the 6th Battalion of the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry and that they landed in France in May 1915. They were very soon plunged into the most intense, horrendous fighting in the woodland area around Ypres in Flanders. At 3.15, on the morning of July the 30th, 1915, 
the German army used for the very first time in war liquid fire flamethrowers used against the British Infantry Brigade and achieving complete surprise. In the fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting that followed, Bale's division suffered huge losses. 2,500 men in one day. One of the British officers reported that the 6th Battalion, despite massive losses, fought on, quote, gloriously, having had no food and no water for 48 hours. 50 members of the battalion were killed in this firestorm, but the remainder stood firm and reoccupied their line of trench. The bodies of a further 40 men in the battalion were found in the cellars of the Cloth Hall in Ypres. In 1916, relentless fighting continued from July to early September without any breakthroughs being achieved. Charles Bow was involved, and somehow Charles Bow survived. Then in 1917, Bow's battalion fought through many major battles as the Germans retreated. But so grievous were their losses that they were ultimately disbanded in February 1918. And the remnant, including Bow, were attached to the Royal Fusiliers. And then, just a few weeks before peace was declared, after endless deprivations and much courageous involvement, Charles Bow was killed in a heavy German barrage and gas attack. We need to reflect on these simple facts. If Bowl had revealed his past as a prisoner, the British Army would never have accepted him for service. When Bowl volunteered for service, it is clear that he deliberately did not mention his prison record. Nor did he state the names of his parents or brothers or sisters, because no next of kin are recorded. And one can only wonder if this was because he had been rejected as the black sheep of the family. And all contact with him had been lost. Certainly it seems that none of the family ever knew what had happened to Charles and hence his name was omitted from any UK war memorial. The fact remains that Charles Bow put himself forward for service. All the historical details demonstrate the fierce, unrelenting battles in which he was involved and the continual loss of friends and comrades which he endured. He who did not need to go, went of his own free will in a cause to resist tyranny and oppression. I think one can fully understand Mike's proposition that such a man deserves to be remembered with honour along with his fellow men of Axmouth, who likewise never returned. And his name in future will be included in our Roll of Honour. We remember these men this morning. We're conscious of the waste and the violence, the greed and the selfishness of war. And in no way do we glamorize war by dwelling on deeds of bravery. But we certainly recoil from the cynicism of those who want to dismiss the whole concept of remembering. Rather, it is our solemn, even our sacred duty, to keep telling the stories. 
Amen. So let us pray. The night before her execution, Edith Cavill said, standing as I do in view of God and eternity, I realize that patriotism is not enough. I must have no hatred or bitterness towards anyone. So let us hold her words in our hearts as we pray. We remember with thanksgiving and sorrow those whose lives in world wars and conflicts past and present have been taken away. We pray for the people who love them in death as in life and for all members of the armed services who are in danger this day, remembering family, friends and all who pray for their safe return. We pray for the wounded and the disturbed, the grieving and the homeless, and all who suffer due to war and conflict. For women and children, and men whose lives are defigured by war and violence. For peacemakers and peacekeepers who seek to keep the world secure and safe. And for those known to us who need Jesus now. God of truth and justice, hear our prayers for all who strive for peace and all who yearn for justice. Help us who today remember the cost of war to work for a better tomorrow. And as we honor the past, may we put our faith in your future. Amen. And the collect for today, Remembrance Sunday. Almighty Father, whose will is to restore all things in your beloved Son, the King of all, govern the hearts and minds of those in authority and bring the families of the nations, divided and torn apart by the ravages of sin, to be subject to his just and gentle rule, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so let's say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We come to our thanksgiving. We offer to Almighty God our thanksgiving for the many blessings with which he has enriched our lives. We thank God for the Queen and her family and all who under her bear the responsibility of government. Thanks be to God. For those who serve in the armed forces of the Crown on sea and land and in the air. Thanks be to God. For doctors, nurses, chaplains, and all who minister to those in need or distress. Thanks be to God. For the unity of our people within the Commonwealth. Thanks be to God. For the sacrifices made, especially in two world wars. Thanks be to God. So a blessing for us as we end our service. May the love of our Lord Jesus Christ draw us to himself. The power of our Lord Jesus strengthen us in his service. The joy of our Lord Jesus fill our hearts. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us all this day and always. Amen. So let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing, fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. Though poppies grow, in Flanders fields. <laughs>